has changed over the last six years is that when we first did these summer schools, we actually had to have this talk at the start because it wasn't as well known. Having heard you all introduce yourselves, I think I have to probably just go sit down for the next hour. You seem to be already on top of a lot of what I'm already going to talk about. So hopefully I don't put you all to sleep if you already have a jet lag. But we'll, we'll continue as we are for now. We uh, welcome interjections as we go along if I've said something that's no longer true or you, you have a different opinion. So just to start off with, I am Australian, I will swear, I uh, apologise ahead of time, I don't mean to cause offence, but it just tends to slip out. Um, I shocked a few Turkish Islamic ladies my first year, so now I try to warn people that it may happen. My mother doesn't approve, but there's not much I can do about it, it's just there. Um, I only got three hours sleep because my body keeps telling me I'm still 13 hours different. So if I start to yawn or nod off at any point, not in my own talk hopefully, but during the course of the day. Again, it's not meant as an offence, uh, it's, it's jet lag, a lot of us have that problem. So it's probably just a, a sign to be tolerant to each other and the various places that we've come from. We do, however, expect lots of questions and interactions. So maybe less in this talk because I think you really will actually most of you know this stuff. But during the course of the week, if you have a lecture where you're really not understanding, don't be afraid to put up your hand and ask a question. We're actually happy to tailor some of the talks or change them around or have impromptu talks. If there's a topic area that people need to understand, that's just not covered. So Rashid gave a terrific impromptu economics 101 class in Turkey because there wasn't that level of economics understanding there. So we're happy to change things as we go along. We also expect it to be interactive, so you'll have the practical sessions in the afternoon that Paul's leading, that we're all going to be involved in, to be hands-on, but it's, it's to be like a workshop kind of thing. It's not a set of boring lectures where you go back and you said, I enjoyed Brazil but I didn't learn anything. We actually want it to be interactive and learn. Um, and also, sorry if I get the name wrong, I call my own children the wrong name, I'm going to get your name wrong at some point. Again, that's not supposed to be offensive. I also apologise if I've ever met you and I can't remember. My brain is Swiss cheese. So, just accept me as I am and hopefully we can have fun this week with, with all of us. So one perspective of looking at the planet is to think about how much of that really is marine. So if you take, it is the single largest habitat on the planet, but if you take all the water on the planet, the fresh water and the salt water, and put it into one little bubble, this is how much water there is on the planet. It's not very big compared to the planet itself. Of that, the ocean is actually less than half. So while again we think of it as this huge amount of water, by the time you've got the water locked up inside aquifers and in the poles and ice and various other things, Oceanic water is actually not the dominant amount of water on the planet. It's a smaller part. If we think about the human use of that water, 50,000 years ago, there is a tiny little blue dot in the middle of Spain there. We used very little of it. We were just touching the edges of what that world was. Over the course of time, that grew. And so by the end, to the start of last century, we were using pretty much all of the shelf seas mainly for fishing and transport, but we had covered off on that area. These days we cover a much larger area. We cover not just the shelf, but also the slope as well, fairly intensively. A lot of that is multiple use, so it's no longer just fisheries or transport. There's energy and mining, recreation and a whole bunch of other things. There is a very, very tiny amount that's still left that is lightly used. But if you've ever seen any of those ocean impact maps, there's pretty much nowhere on the planet, even in the high seas, where there isn't some human signature these days. We don't intensively use the high seas yet, but it, it's coming, basically. Uh, there's quite a lot of services that we produce uh, or depend on from the ocean. So ecologically, there's a lot of nutrient cycling. There's breeding grounds and habitats and nurseries, all the sort of things that you learn in your ecology classes about what the ocean provides. The, about 25% of the global productivity comes from the oceans. That can be discussed in many different ways, but the idea is that there's quite a lot of processes that we don't necessarily think about, like the filtering of pollutants and the nutrient cycling, that are pretty key to the way that we live. 
Now, if we think of the industries that we directly use, uh, there are the classic ones, food, for instance, fisheries makes up 90% of that still. Aquaculture is actually, uh, sorry, marine fisheries and aquaculture make up 90% of that. Uh, there's water though, so desalination coming through now as a, as a major source, particularly in the Middle East. It's over 90% of the world's trade moves by ship around the world and enormous vessels that um, in some cases can't get through places like the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, so they're having to re-engineer these ancient tradeways because these vessels are so huge. There's also the recreational opportunities in places like Australia. One in every four people goes recreational fishing. One in every two people will go to the beach at least once a year in Australia. But it's got beyond that now, which are things that we traditionally did with the oceans. We're moving things that we used to do on land into the ocean. So things like mining and energy generation used to be land things, but now ocean things. And that's putting extra complications into the way that we do things. So if we look at these numbers, are a little bit old now, they're a few years old. Um, I couldn't get to the numbers fast enough, well my internet connection in my hotel room isn't the greatest I must admit, so I couldn't update this for you, but basically there is about 5% of the world's GDP tied up in direct marine industries, uh, with fisheries uh, not actually even the biggest among them, it's actually oil and gas, it's the energy sector that's now dominating the marine industries. But that kind of pales in comparison to the amount of the world's GDP that's actually dependent on ocean ecosystem services. This is a point where I have some contention to have with the economists, so Rashid and I like to arm wrestle about this point quite a lot. They give a number to those ecosystem services. I find it hard to put a value on the fact that every second breath that I take, the oxygen comes from ocean productivity. So for me, that's kind of almost valueless. It's such an enormous concept. But it is obviously something that's very important to us if it's going to change. Something that's had a long-term history on us is, though, is that cultural and social values that Ingrid will talk about later in the week. There's been many thousands of years of the influence of the oceans on the way that we think. And in places like Australia, it's really fundamental to the image that we have of ourselves. So as a little kid in Australia, you get taught that we rode on the sheep's back. That was all about farming. But if you talk to the average Australian, it's actually as much about the ocean. We see ourselves as a marine nation, we even call ourselves that. So it's really caught up in the way that we think about ourselves. So how have we thought historically about the effects of climate change on the oceans? So it, we've known for over 100 years what the physical impact of climate change will be. Arrhenius's models were pretty much on the ball mark when he did them with pencil and paper. It's a rather unique way to get over a divorce, writing world's first climate model with a pen and paper and taking about three years. It kept him occupied though. We haven't really didn't move on much from that till about the 1980s and it's only been in the last 10 to 20 years where we've started to really understand or think about some of the ecological impacts and the social impacts that are actually going to come along with that. So what a moment that was quite seminal for me was I knew that there was a big footprint. I've worked in marine ecosystems now for close to 20 years, but something that drove home to me the effect that we'd had on the planet was when I saw the photos from the International Space Station. So this is just one of them over Europe. We really have set the world afire. So it's very hard to deny that there's a very big human imprint on the world these days. So, I don't know if this movie's going to play, but if we can give it a crack. The story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. The population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. 
the 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining, and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy, and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to nine billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So that uh, little movie was made to come out at about the same time as the last IPCC report, to get across to the general public the kind of role that humans really now have in reshaping our planet. So particularly since the 1950s and the Great Acceleration, the, the way that we use the planet has rapidly accelerated to a point that we are hitting some of those planetary boundaries in a way that we'd never anticipated before. And it's not just the use of the ecosystems in the world, it's actually the effect that we're having on them has also accelerated. So cumulative impacts and non-linear change are now far bigger concern than at any other point in time and we're still way behind in the science of how to deal with those non-linearities. We still, as a human, our brain likes to make incremental changes and add things up. It's not good with non-linearities and multiplications and that kind of stuff. So we're still struggling on that one. But there is, as they said in the movie, some good news too. So the ozone hole is an example of that. It was a big threat when I was a small child. They thought it would get much, much larger through time. But there was a lot of political tension about what they could do about that threat. So the Europeans said that was a no-go. There was we couldn't change the economy enough without ruining the world to, to combat it. The Americans actually pushed for the changes with CFCs. But if you go through and list down all the arguments made, it was it was going to be too expensive. It was going to destroy the economy. Not every country would buy on board so that there would be cheats who would benefit at the cost of others that it would be something that completely disabled the world's economy. Do those arguments sound so, so, uh, familiar? They're exactly the same arguments they put up today about why we can't act on climate change more rapidly in places like Australia. What they found though, once they put those changes in place, was they weren't as costly as they expected because new technologies came online, behaviour changes happened, but it was also avoided losses. Not as many people were getting sick from cancer from the ozone holes. The acid rain that was associated with some of the use of these chemicals dropped off. So the benefits of making the change greatly outweighed the costs. And these days we don't even think about the ozone hole unless you live in a place like Tasmania where it still actually sits over us in some. So it is a positive story that humans can work together to reverse some of these large-scale signatures that we've had on the planet. So in terms of the things that the Anthropocene has seen, most of the general public still doesn't appreciate that we do those things, that we move that amount of rock, that we are the dominant geological process on the planet right now. 
And some of the ones that are particularly important for us is the time since the ocean is the way that we're making it right now. So it's about 55 million years since the ocean was as hot as it's going to be by the end of the century. It's about 300 million years since it was as acidic as it's likely to be by the end of the century. So pretty much no living species has ever experienced those conditions before, let alone the speed of the change. And that's one of the biggest effects well, because it's happening so fast. So if we look at the speed of that change, so in geology they kind of do plots back to front to the ecology. Uh, so ecologists would run time this way, geologists for whatever reason run time back the other way. So the open circles here are data points from things like ice cores and sediments and things like that. And then the solid points are the projected model change. So again, this is a little bit out of date. Some of the changes are actually projected to be a bit bigger than on these dotted lines. But you can see it's effectively this sudden change as far as the ecology and geology of the world is concerned. It's a really sharp change to conditions that we haven't seen for many, many millions of years. And all of that has to come in the context of there's an expression that to change the world is like rebuilding an aeroplane while you're in the air and you can't get off. So we have to do the restructuring of the system and understand how it's going to change with 7 billion people already alive and another 2 billion coming over the next 20 to 30 years. So it's not an insignificant challenge that we've got. Part of that is that the system is already greatly changed. So if you look at the coral reefs of the world, there's only about a third of those coral reefs that are in good condition right now. The majority of them are actually damaged or degraded already. Similarly with fisheries, there's about a third of the world's fisheries that are currently in a sustainable state. The other two thirds are either still being overfished or are recovering from past overfishing. So the system, the marine systems are already under stress and they have these extra stresses being put on. So that's kind of the challenge that we face. Now to get to some of the mechanisms. So I'm pretty sure everyone in this room probably already knows this, but in Australia we have an expression about how to tell your grandmother to suck eggs. Unfortunately I'm about to tell you how to do that because I'm going to explain climate change to you. So basically when you release the, uh, the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, they act like a blanket around the planet. The sunlight comes in but can't get back out again. So it's a bit like having a big doom being put around the planet. Uh, and that has led to noticeable change already. So again, over the last few years, you've probably heard in, well, in places like Australia, you still hear that it's not real, it's all flattened off, it was a big hoax, it's not happening. Uh, it, in reality it is happening, so you can see that there is quite a strong trend over the last hundred years in the average temperature, the sea surface temperature for instance. But in any natural time series there's bits that go up and down with variation and there's flat bits. And that's effectively what happened as part of the argument in the last few years. They picked a particularly hot year and then it seemed flat from there. If they picked the next year it would have actually still been quite a strong increase. A little bit of a statistical oops there in, in choosing your extreme outlier as your baseline point. That's probably less than number one for anyone in the room. Uh, and if you put in the extra years that have happened since, which I haven't because I couldn't get on the internet to get it to work, the, uh, it's just continued to climb. So, we, uh, so for instance in Australia in this last year we've had our absolute hottest days in both the ocean and the land ever. And that's just a continuing, and I think nine of our ten hottest days ever have all been in the last five years. So we, it's something that is already happening, but a key part of all this is the degree of variation, that it's not just a linear trend that's happening, it's the degree of variation around that, which is quite important for agriculture. Agriculture didn't start until the start of the Holocene, when the variation effectively disappeared. Whoa. I need to go back right there. Keep going back. Yeah, 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 there we are. The other part is that a lot of this heat is going into the ocean. So we call it climate warming or global change. In fact, it's the ocean warming. 90% of the heat has actually been stored in the deep oceans and we're starting to potentially exceed that capacity. So what kind of signatures have we got that it's already happening? So glaciers are potentially one of the best known. So there's obviously the fact that they're shrinking and that's restructuring some of the geology. I work a lot in Patagonia now. It was really a bit 
well, interesting, but also frightening as I was going down the fjords in Patagonia to see how they're being reshaped by the retraction of the glaciers, which are allowing slumps down into the fjords. As uh, someone who works on the aquaculture down there, I think it would be pretty terrifying to be on an aquaculture farm in a fjord and suddenly see this huge tsunami of water coming towards you because the glacier is no longer there to hold the mountain together and it's all falling down. Uh, so it's having some real world effects pretty much already. Part of that is in the Arctic, so we've obviously had a contraction of the Arctic ice in the last few decades. Potential for ice-free years are pretty much on the horizon already. But it's creating some other complications as well. So, for instance, in the Greenland ice sheet, it used to only melt along the edges. By the early 2000s, it was melting all the way around Greenland, and in 2012, they had a pretty seminal event. Not only had the edge melting happen quite broadly, but they had a few days where the entire surface of Greenland started to melt. So it didn't melt very deep, it's not like the whole thing suddenly became rock. It was just a thin band across the top. But that water then gets under the ice and helps accelerate the ice slide off the land, which can contribute to sea level. The other scary part, while I think about Greenland, is just in the last couple of weeks they've realised there's an extra effect of all that ice uh, loss in the Arctic, and particularly in Greenland. I don't know how many of you were alive to remember the Cold War. I was a small child, but there's all these old nuclear bases buried in the ice across the, around the Arctic Circle. And based on some sampling they've done just recently in Greenland, they're becoming exposed. So there's a whole bunch of toxic waste about to be released from the Arctic as well. So it's just kind of those unintended consequences of us not cleaning up after ourselves initially and then thinking it would be locked away forever that are also coming up to create surprises. Potentially though, one of the biggest effects is around the variability. So for instance, precipitation. We're already starting to see a great deal of change in the way that the weather patterns work. So for instance, in Australia, and particularly in Tasmania, it's going to get drier. So on average, our precipitation will drop quite substantially through time, but it's actually going to arrive in much larger packets. So we're going to have some huge storms, dump all of the annual rain, and then it'll just dry off from there, which has implications on the social side that Ingrid will cover off on a bit. But basically, how do insurance companies cope? None of the old houses in Australia were built for that. I had a nice... Uh, waterfall form in my kitchen a couple of years ago when my roof just was like, oh, I can't cope with this, we'll just let it go straight through. And so I literally had this wall of water across the middle of my kitchen. It was quite a stunning effect, but it didn't do much on my computer that happened to be sitting underneath it. <coughs> so these kind of extreme events that we're seeing, whether they're floods or droughts, used to be a once in a hundred year event. They're already a once in every ten year event, and within the next couple of decades they'll become the new normal. So they'll happen every year or every other year. And so society and ecosystems have to learn how to deal with that effectively because the change is going to be so much on them all the time, they won't get a break. So we've already started to see some social change in Australia. Well, you've got some people who deny that it's happening at all. The weatherman has actually added some extra colours to the Australian temperature map. We used to stop at temperature 46, which was nicely at the dark red end of things. And then for a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago, right in the centre of Australia, it got so hot for long enough that all of the roads melted because it was up to 54 degrees for a whole week. They were quite happy when the temperature dropped back to 43, which sounded still ridiculously high to me in Tasmania. But it didn't mean that the poor weatherman had to break his pretty pattern, so they had black and bright pink at the top end of the rain. The other thing that's happening though is increasingly enormous storms. So if we look at the storm patterns in Australia over the last 150 years, or so the recorded history in Australia, there's been as many large storms in the last decade as in the whole rest of the time period. So these are quite large Category 5 cyclones. This is a picture of Yazi as it came in across the Great Barrier Reef and did quite a lot of damage there to habitats and corals and seagrasses which then had knock-on effects because the dugongs and turtles in the following year didn't have enough feed, so there was a good deal more mortality. To give you a sense of the size of that cyclone, if we look north-south along the coastline, the cyclonic winds spread along a distance as long as Japan. Or if we look east-west, that bigger cloud across out across the Coral Sea, 
and we superimpose that on, say, North America, it would have been 80% of North America under a cyclone all at once. So these are pretty huge storms that are coming through, and they're doing some major... Luckily, loss of life in Australia was pretty low, in particular with this storm, because it actually been a level three cyclone four days beforehand, which kind of tidied the place up first, before Yazi came through. So if he did come through first, there would have been a lot more loss of life and damage. There are quite large economic hits from this kind of activity though, so if we hit the... So bananas became a luxury item in Australia there for about six months. It used to cost me $15 a banana at one point, which was a little bit extreme, I felt, trying to feed my children. But the, the, I don't know if you can read it at the back, it says battered but not beaten. So Australians are pretty determined that we're not going to be knocked on the head by this, but the insurance company is of another mind. And it's not just in the tropics. So this is a map of Australia. The yellow bit in the middle is where people don't live. So there's about 2% of Australia's population in the middle. Most of us live along the east coast of Australia, pretty much down from about Brisbane to uh, Melbourne. So if we just concentrate on the east coast of Australia. In June this year, we had a big storm cell start in Brisbane and then just basically work its way down every populated place in Australia over a four day period. So there was about 15 people who died in that, which sounds pretty low when you compare it to some of the disasters that have happened around the world where hundreds of thousands of people have died. But for Australia, within 24 hours, there were $250 million worth of insurance claims made. And if you look at what it did, because boats couldn't move, trucks couldn't move, bridges were down, there's still some communities in Tasmania that are completely isolated because the bridges have been destroyed. It's been about four and a half billion dollars, Australian dollars worth of damage in four days. So globally that's now becoming a pretty common story with over 170 billion a year in damage due to extreme events. So it's the reinsurance companies of the world that are the most worried about climate change. They're the single biggest industry on the planet and they want to see action, but they know that the constraining factor is they don't understand a, how this is going to change into the future, but also the knock-on events. So tourism claims haven't even started yet, uh, but there's been some knock-on effects from that kind of storm activity as well. So the other thing that's been happening around Australia is enormous marine heat waves. So in Tasmania, we had one for we had one that lasted about 270 days, and it was many degrees warmer than normal. Up on the Great Barrier Reef, I don't know if this made the international news, but the blue spots here, this is the percentage that didn't bleach. So less than 1% of the northern Great Barrier Reef didn't bleach this year. 10% of the central zone and 25% down here. Now, of that, the severely bleached stuff, there was about 80% that severely bleached here, so more than half of it will die. Here it was about a third of the reef was very severely bleached. Down here it was less than 1%, but this is exactly where the crown of thorns and the past storms had already destroyed, about 80% of the coral. So the Great Barrier Reef itself is quite under pressure um, from the climate events. But it's not just the Great Barrier Reef. 7,000 hectares of mangroves died across northern Australia at the same time because of the heat wave of the water coming up into the into the areas. Now these are pretty resilient species that normally hadn't, you know, hadn't been affected at all, but there's now this ghostly white across the north of Australia. Uh, and it's not just the north, this is down the west coast of Australia where there, um, another marine heat wave sat for a couple of months last year and where the red bars are at the top is where we've lost kelp colonies. So giant kelp no longer are the mainstay of the habitats there. It's been replaced by turfing algae, so you can imagine that the species that use that area have turned over as well. We're yet to appreciate what has happened in the last 270 days around Tasmania. We're still coming to learn, but those kind of marine hotspots and heat waves are beginning to happen around the world. So if we think of Tasmania as little as... When I first moved to Tasmania 20 years ago, you basically were well, someone who'd been living in the tropics, I'd, find it hard to go in Tasmanian water at all, but if you're from the North Sea, like Lorraine, you would think that for six months of the year it would be fine to dump into the ocean because it's not completely frozen. Uh, 
That period has now shrunk to three months, and what that has meant is that there's quite a lot more species that can live in Tasmania than used to in the past. So there's at least 45 species confirmed to have moved into Tasmania. Centra stephanus, the uh, sea urchin, is one of the, the most dominant that we see because it's brought urchins barren, urchin barrens with it where the urchins eat away all the kelp. We've never seen those in Tasmania before and now they've become a steady part of how the ecosystem works. So we're starting to understand what that means. Coral reefs now live in New South Wales, not just in Queensland. In fact, we're three days off being able to have a coral reef grow in Sydney Harbour. So that's how much the temperatures around Australia have changed, even in the course of my working lifetime. And it's not just in Australia. This is a paper from 2013 that shows the degree of polewood shift across all the different kinds of taxa around the world. So pretty much every kind of taxa in the world is trying to run to the poles to get away from the heat or is changing the way that they do things like reproduction or the timing of uh, movements and things. So a lot of those things used to be temperature triggered so that they're happening at a different time, which can mean that they don't line up with the prey or the location that they're really supposed to happen in. So there's one particular species of crab, for instance, in the Alaska, where the adult crabs live at depth, so they're down in super cold water. And they've been happily coming up and spawning for, for millennia. What they don't know is in the last 10 to 15 years, none of their babies have survived. All the larvae have been destroyed by heat. So that population is basically on a heading to nowhere. When those adults finally die off, that population will be completely gone. And there's species like that that are facing challenges pretty much everywhere. So what does it mean for how much temperature we're actually going to see? So this is from the RCPs that came out in the last IPCC round. So an RCP is the representative carbon pathway. So instead of getting caught up in the discussion of how, what kind of story gets us to what kind of release of carbon, it was basically, okay, what happens if we manage to have a low carbon release because we get our shit together and we can stop doing things? Uh, what happens, a middle, middle range where we kind of taper off, we don't necessarily invent new technology to suck carbon down like we do in the bottom one, but we at least tail off. Well, what happens if we just keep going like the idiots that we appear to be at the present moment and we just keep skyrocketing up for at least another century? So that's the kind of range band. So you can see that if we do manage to get everything together, which is given that we're kind of already here, is a bit questionable, we might be able to meet the Paris Accord. Uh, more likely that we're going to end up around here. So that degree of change is the kinds of temperatures that we've already seen change in some spots where there's been massive ecosystem shifts. So it's likely that we will see quite strong change through time, but it's not going to be uniform. So this is, I think this might even be from one of Laurent's earlier work. It's probably got an updated picture to show you at some point. But the main picture, main point about this is it's not uniform across the world. There's some places they're going to see a lot more change than others, and that's where you get the social inequalities that Ingrid will talk about later in the week, because it seems to be an unfortunate case that a lot of the places who are least able to cope with change, you're probably going to see the biggest degree of change. So to give you a bit of a sense of why that's a problem is that all of these predictions in our understanding today is based on what we already know. But over the course of the last 10 years, it's been pretty clear that because we're moving into a state we've never been before, there's a whole bunch of surprises. So some of this is around the human responses. So given that they started talking about climate change pretty close to 20 years ago, you would have thought by now people would have done something about it. And in fact, that was some of the earlier assumptions in the previous things before the RCPs, the scenarios before that, was that there would be some degree of change and slowing. There wasn't no one had allowed for, we're not doing anything. That, but we had to sort of add that with this last round of RCPs. Uh, there's also a thing called overcompensation that humans tend to love to do. So the global financial crisis kicked in here and actually slowed our carbon release. But in recovering from the global financial crisis, we tended to even more overcompensate than we had before, and we've just shot up even more. So while human changes in what they do can mitigate the carbon release, we've actually got to get some real change if that's going to come down, particularly if you're going to try and do the sort of things like really pull carbon back down. 
So a lot of the unex unexpected feedbacks in the system are based around humans, or the ones we expect to see are based around humans and how we respond to the situation. But there will be ecosystem ones, ecological ones, physical ones that also crop up that we just don't know about yet because we've never had to experience that world before. And that's pretty important because if we think about the oceans, we, don't, we know jack sheet basically. So if we think about my hand here, that bit's the surface of the ocean. My thumb is the sediment in the oceans. Pretty much where you can see flesh, that's the bit of the ocean we know anything about. All the bit in the middle? Fuck all. Okay? So it's really been in the last couple of years that we started to appreciate how much biology happens in the rest of the ocean. So, was it two years ago that Carlos's paper came out about mesoplegics, the most common vertebrate on the planet? We didn't even click till about two years ago. Billions of tons of small fish that move up and down in the water column, helping do pumping and nutrient cycling and feed other animals. We just never paid attention to them. And they're being affected by climate change. We increasingly moved to the surface by a lack of oxygen, which is radically changing the way the pumps work. So we do know that there's been large-scale biodiversity turnover. If we even just look at catch records, we're making the world a weedier place with more fast-growing things. Uh, so the blue bars and the, the lighter orange bars there. You do have to be a little bit careful in interpreting catch records. So for instance, here you'd think there'd been a major catastrophic biodiversity crash in Antarctica. I know it was the end of the Soviet Union and a change in market size and regulation. So you do have to be a little bit careful about interpreting catch data, but in the main, it's pretty evident that we're changing the structure of ecosystems. We're making them like terrestrial ecosystems where there's a lot of weed. We do know that we're in the sixth great mass extinction, and while we can't say a priori what will come out the other side, we do know from past mass extinctions it's usually a dominant group that goes, uh, and that there's large-scale ecosystem restructuring afterwards. So we know we're going to be living in interesting times, as the old Chinese saying goes. There's lots of different ways that uh, climate change can affect the oceans. So temperature is a really obvious one, we've already covered that. Sea level rise is the next most obvious, at least to the public. Acidification is one that's getting a lot of scientific attention right now, but apoxia and some other things are also on the rise. And that's kind of ignoring the fact that we should really be talking about global change in the way, all the different ways that humans interact with the system and, that's, and how much of that's now moving into the oceans. So if we think about sea level rise for a second, uh, at the present moment the IPCC suggests it's between about 20 centimetres and a metre by the end of the decade. That's been quite a contentious discussion in that realm because it depends on how much melting you get. But the important part is that pretty much every major megacity in the world is already within a metre of the ocean. So 80% of the world's population already lives in the danger zone. So again, some motivation for us to get our shit together and get something happening. One of the major things that is happening already though is that this is the biological and nutrient physical pumps that happen in the ocean about how it gets drawn down and recirculated. If we think about how climate change interacts with that, temperature is already slowing down and will continue to slow down some of the, some of the biological pumps. Uh, acidification is slowing down the particulate pumps. So there are feedback mechanisms in the way that climate change is already working that could exacerbate the situation, so change our understanding of how those pumps work. So we now know the pH of the ocean, its measure of acidity and alkalinity, is going to alter rapidly this coming century. It's one of the most profound changes we humans are making to our Earth's life support system. Here we can see how our ocean has already become more acidic since 1950. Now watch as we race through to the year 2300, the progressive change in colours representing a trend towards more acidic conditions. <coughs> The acidity of the ocean is in fact changing faster today than at any time in the last 300 million years. So 
while it's likely that there will still be calcifying organisms around in 2300, the whole of the ocean isn't going to dissolve, that there's coping mechanisms, we do know that there are effects. And so some parts of the ocean will see this kind of super acidic state very much quicker, particularly in places like the poles or where there's strong upwellings bringing that deep acidic water to the surface. And it's already affecting shellfish industries in places like western the US. The other part that we know is that you're likely to get some large-scale ecosystem shifts. So we know from paleoecology that the last time, every time there's been a major shift in the acidity of the ocean like there is now, sponge reefs have come to dominate instead of coral reefs, so there's certainly been a change in the compositional makeup of reefs. So that has implications, not necessarily for the mum and dad recreational people who probably can't tell the difference, but for the ecosystems that depend on them there's going to be some big difference. It, the speed of the change is probably the key part though. So a lot of the animals that we immediately think of as being most affected, like pteropods and coccolithophores, actually are very fast animals. They have multiple life history generations within a single year. But a mechanism that is very, very slow to change is the way that vertebrate brains work. So a lot of the research that's happening at James Cook University has shown that even with epigenetic shifts, so even with adults that have got used to the ocean and are evolving with it in an acidified world, have got used to it and are acclimated and their offspring are that little bit more able to cope. The part that breaks down and doesn't cope very well or doesn't change very rapidly because it's been locked in pretty much the same way for hundreds of millions of years is the way the brain works. So what it means is that those fish either forget that they're supposed to be afraid of predators or if they're the predator, they forget what they're supposed to be looking for. So uh, suddenly finding your mother as the most attractive thing on the planet is probably not great for sexual reproduction in coral reef fish, but it's one of the outcomes that happen. So inbreeding rates <laughs> skyrocket with deleterious genetic outcomes. Survivorship drops off, not because it's a chemical response, but because they're just like, oh, that's a big scary thing. Oh, I forgot to run away. I got eaten. So it's some of the things that we're not expecting and we're not thinking about around behaviour that is going to be potentially some of the biggest effects on the, say, for coral reefs. One of the effects that we're starting to see now that isn't so much about acidification but other things we hadn't really thought about is the degree of stratification of the ocean and how that's changed nutrient cycling and what can come up into the surface or what's trapped in the surface. Uh, that changes not only productivity but also hypoxia. So that's, eutrophication also is amplifying those effects. So if we think of hypoxic big dead zones around the world, they're pretty much in every continent now, but in hotspot places like up in the um, Baltic and in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, where human pollution on land has come into the ocean and has now made the bottom layers effectively oxygen free in large parts, which concentrates all the biology in the, the space left. So that it changes the degree of flux. So if we try to play with an ecopath model later in the week, but we speed up the size of the, the interactions or the, the size of the availability matrix, you can see that the system becomes a lot more unstable and vulnerable. Oxygen concentration change has the potential to change quite broadly across the oceans, concentrating life up in those upper levels, but that's the levels that are most likely to heat. So, for instance, squid aren't necessarily directly affected by acidification, but the oxygen concentrations drive them to the surface where they can't tolerate the heat shift, and so their body metabolism starts to break down. So even some of the species we think are most robust to climate change are actually pretty vulnerable once you have the combination of factors kicking in. Pretty much the only animal that seems to be, or only kinds of animals that seem to be able to tolerate low oxygen, high temperature, low pH, the wall that we're making are jellyfish, so I hope you like jellyfish, we're going to have a lot more of them into the future. The um, other thing we're starting to see is the potential for primary productivity changes. So again, Laurent probably has much more up-to-date pictures than this, but basically it's likely that the primary production will shift with the potential for a loss of primary production across the more tropical realms and in a potential increase at the poles, but that has differential outcomes for the biology of groups. So this is some recent work by William Chung and his group about the degree of biodiversity turnover and invasion. So you can see that tropical band where productivity changes 
Desert is also the place where you see the most turnover in biodiversity and effects uh, across that, that middle band of the world where people are probably less able to cope. They're much more dependent on the oceans for productivity and survival themselves. So there's quite strong knock-on social effects. A little bit older work is some more work by William trying to look at shifts in fishing. And again, there's probably some more up-to-date pictures than that these days. But basically, it's likely the productivity that we get out of the oceans will also shift as we go forward, both in terms of the aquaculture, but also the fisheries. So in some places, that can be as much as a 50 to 100% change in what productivity they're seeing. So there's a group called the Intersectoral Intermodal Comparison Group, ICMIP, and they're trying to connect up across agriculture and fisheries models. And it seems that there's a double whammy going on. Just in those locations where population growth is the highest, agricultural production is likely to take the biggest hit possible, and similarly with fisheries. So there's a, going to be a really big collision between where there's the demand for food and where there's the ability to produce it. And then you combine that with the demand for water. Places like Saudi Arabia used to be completely self-sufficient in agricultural production and now have to import 90% of it because they've run out of water. So the, what that means for trade and potentially human conflict is going to shift quite a lot as we go forward. <coughs> As will ecosystems. So this is a little bit of the work from Southeast Australia. So this is a bit of a cartoon, but basically at the present moment we have primary production that feeds fish, particularly those mesopelagic fish that live in the centre of the water column, and a lot of invertebrates. So Australia has got a bit of an odd ecosystem compared to the rest of the world. Uh, as it runs forward under climate change, though, what we're likely to see is more and more primary production from species that don't really contribute to the existing ecosystem. So that, that big bowl of mesopelagic fish that's relied on will start to shrink away and not bother coming. There will be species turnover. So there still will be an ecosystem. It just won't be with the same species or the same species mixes necessarily. We can still sustainably use it, but we'll have to be light on our feet about how we do that and what it means. So Australians, for instance, currently don't eat small pelagic fish. Anchovies on an Australian pizza are something that our immigrant friends do, but... Uh, native born Australians are likely not to do it. Uh, but we will likely have to in the future because there will be many more of them and we won't have as many options of the things that we currently eat. So there are many, many different ways that climate change can affect both the land and the sea uh, with a lot more knock-on effects than I can cover here. So Ingrid will pick up some of these. But it's right down to what it's doing to human health and mobility of people and the kind of movement of people that we've seen in recent years probably won't be unusual. So sitting in Australia, yes, there's quite a lot of northern Australia that's desert and there's crocodiles and killer everything, sharks and jellyfish and you name it, it's pretty deadly up there. But when you're sitting in Indonesia or you're sitting in Bangladesh and you've got 25 to 75 million people whose houses have gone underwater but they have nowhere else to go, it's quite likely that we're going to see quite a large expansion of the movement of the people around the globe as they try to deal with these kind of outcomes. So uh, more than 80% of the world's population is going to live... One more? Yep, one more? Yep. And one more? Yep. Is going to live um, along the coasts by the 2050. So that's, that's going to be a huge additional pressure on those coastlines that have already seen wet, wetlands loss and mangrove loss and a bunch of other pressures. So it's not going to be just the marine space that gets restructured, it's actually going to be the coastal space altogether. And that's already a pretty crowded space, so if we see in Australia it's pretty much where most of our activities already happen and that's going to become the increasing pattern the world over, which will bring up the question of how you manage those locations. So that's something that China already has to experience. So as an Australian, I like to go to the beach when there's no one else around. I like to be able to see the, see the sand and the ocean and kind of feel like I'm the only person in the water. Not so much in China. Um, it's kind of a living mass of people. Even in a swimming pool, it's quite hard to find your way, let alone in the ocean. But they face the problem of they, there's so much happening along the coastline there. As you fly over it, it's not clear where the land begins. There's 35,000 people that live in a floating set of aquaculture pens, for instance, just off 
Shanghai. So it's already having to deal with quite a crowded space. <coughs> And this is a management problem that we've faced for many millennia. So the oldest records of how to manage the ocean are more than 7,000 years old. They have pretty much all the same rules that we try to use today. So we have to come up with new ways of doing the social and human side as well as um, the understanding the ecosystems because capital punishment in the history was one of the main means of, say, dealing with illegal fishing. It's not something that's going to fly under current humanitarian rights, so we have to be a bit more inventive about how we manage the ocean successfully. We can't do what Emperor Claudius did, which was just close all Italian waters to fishing on threat of death until his favourite fish was abundant again, uh, or use the entire Roman navy to move it from the Black Sea. So we have to get a bit more inventive than they have been in the past. And that comes down to balancing trade-offs. And that's why something like IMBA is so important, because it's not just about the biophysical world. It's about the economic and social world and finding a balance between all of that. And so hopefully that's what you'll learn about for the rest of this week. <laughs>